Thank you, Mark, and good morning. It's good to be back with you after a forced vacation last week. Uh, thankful to Jeff for stepping in uh, at short notice, but it is uh, good to be back and continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 12, and we've been in chapter 12, but let me just give a brief review of what we've covered in the past few weeks. This is the last week of the Lord's life. We've entered that section of the gospel, and it's a number of chapters, I think six chapters devoted to that, which shows the importance of it. But this is Tuesday of that last week, and it's known as the Day of Questions, and known for that because a series of questions were put to him by different groups. The first one was the Pharisees and the Herodians, who were natural enemies, but their fear of Christ, their dislike of Him brought them together in this uh, alliance and they put a question to Him about taxes. Is it right to pay the tax to Caesar? And the point was to trap Him because it, whatever answer He gave they thought would polarize Him, would either upset Him with the multitudes if He said, yes, you should pay the tax or if he said no, then they'll get in trouble with the authorities. And so they thought they trapped him and he answered, render under Caesar, Caesar the things that are Caesar and under God the things that are God's. So the Sadducees tried their hand at it and they asked him a question about the resurrection. A woman had seven husbands in the resurrection. Whose wife will she be? And he answered that in a way that... Uh, they had completely unexpected, not expected. That was probably a question that they had used very successfully against the, the Pharisees because the Pharisees believed in the resurrection and the Sadducees didn't. And here that question which had been so successfully used was answered and now could not be used any longer. So he made a great display of understanding of the Word of God and the wisdom uh, of applying it properly. And he silenced his enemies. And so this brings us to the last question of the Day of Questions in verse 28. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognized that he had answered them well. Asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and there is no one else besides him and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. I was reading a commentary by a British author, Harold St. John, in which he wrote, We live in a chilly, loveless world where in political life, the stronger nations exploit the weaker ones. He then narrowed his analysis of the world and wrote, In social circles, business is often carried on as if we were a pack of wolves instead of a band of brothers. Men are ruled by the love of money, a root of every kind of evil, which in their inexorable working fling out the unfit and the aged on the scrap heaps of society. In other words, it's a cruel world. He wrote that a little over a decade after the Second World War when a generation witnessed a terrific bloodletting 
not just in Europe, but in Asia and across the globe. And nothing has changed. The world is as loveless as ever. What can we do about that? What we often do is declare there ought to be a law. And so governments make laws to curb cruelty. No society was more ready to do that and skilled to do that than the Jews. They lived under the law. And to be fair to them, that law was given to them by God. And there were a lot of laws given to them. One rabbi, Rabbi Simlai, in the third century said that Moses gave 365 prohibitions and 248 positive commands, totaling 613 commands in the Bible. Now, I haven't counted them, but I have no reason to doubt that. That's a lot. But then the rabbis went beyond that. To guard the laws God had given Moses to build what they called a fence around the law and protect it from abuse, they added more laws of their own. For example, the fourth commandment in Exodus chapter 20 is to keep the Sabbath. That was done by not doing any work. Simple enough. But the question then arose, what constitutes work? Picking up sticks on the Sabbath? Well, that's work. You wouldn't think so, but a man was put to death because he did that. So they debated this. And they came up, up with very precise rules to define, define exactly what could and could not be done on the Sabbath. They had a whole list of details of what a physician could do, what a laborer could do. By the time of the Lord, read in John chapter 5, a man is healed, a lame man. He picks up his bed. He begins to walk home. And the rabbis and the Pharisees stop him. What are you doing carrying your bed on the Sabbath? That's breaking the Sabbath. All kinds of rules. Or Exodus chapter 23 and verse 19, the prohibition, you are not to boil a young goat in the milk of its mother. Now that law is repeated three times in the law. So it's clearly important, but that's all it says. And yet, from that command, Jews develop the kosher diet, separating dairy from meat, and an observant Jew, as a result, can't eat a cheeseburger. Over time, through debates and discussions, the rabbis developed a great body of traditions with thousands of rules for daily living. But that presented a problem. Man by nature is a systematizer. He can't live with disorder or contradiction. He has to put it together. He has to put things in their proper order. And the scribes needed to know which were the most important commandments. They're not all equal. So which ones are the most important and which ones are the lesser commandments? And which one is the greatest of the commandments? And so they weighed and evaluated the commandments and engaged in hair-splitting debates to determine all of that. There are some early Jewish stories on this. The one is about a student who asked the famous rabbi Hillel if he could recite the whole law while standing on one foot. So he stood on one foot and said, what you yourself hate do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole law. The rest is commentary. Go and learn. So this question, what is the greatest commandment, the controlling principle of the law, was a very important one among Jewish scholars. And it's a question that a scribe brought to Jesus. It was Tuesday, the day of questions. When the Lord's opponents put a series of trick, trick questions to him in an attempt to trap him in an answer that would incriminate him, that would alienate him from the crowds and uh, dispel the popularity that he enjoyed. 
And we can be glad that they did that. Otherwise, we might not have the wisdom and revelation the Lord gave with the answers that uh, he gave to these men. They meant evil against him, but God meant it for good. God does that. He is absolutely sovereign and able even to turn evil into good, and we see that here. Now, it's not clear that evil was intended in this last question here in verse 28. It, it seems it was asked in a different tone with um, a different objective, with real interest and sincerity. That is the picture Mark gives. The scribe was encouraged to ask the question that he asked because of the insightful answers that the Lord had already given. The enemies had failed to trap him. He, his answers that he, he gave, the way he responded to them, was, was completely wise and biblical and authoritative. And it impressed this, this man. And what seems perhaps to have impressed him most of all was this answer that he gave to the Pharisees about the resurrection because as a scribe he stumbled over that perhaps as well. They may have tripped him up with that question and here the Lord answers this question and he was amazed. It silenced all of the others and so with that he was emboldened to ask Jesus, what commandment is the foremost of all? Now assuming this was an earnest conscientious scribe, he must have felt the weight of the law, of trying to keep all of those commandments, 613, not to mention all of the hair-splitting rules and regulations that the rabbis had added, added to that, and he would, must have wondered, what is the most important thing that I can do of all of these things that I'm trying to do? Is it keeping the Sabbath? Is it uh, living a chaste and pure life? Is it uh, keeping myself from boiling a kid in its mother's milk? What? So I can imagine that this had been weighing greatly on him, and also I can imagine that when he puts this question to the Lord, the Lord said within himself, now this is a good question. He answered it by quoting two passages of the Old Testament. The first in verses 29 and 30 is the famous Shema, named after the first word of Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, the word here. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. I can say that on one foot. <laughs> Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Thirty years ago, uh, a zealous Jew went uh, throughout the old city of Jerusalem uh, and wrote on all of the great gates of that city the Hebrew words of Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 inside the arch of those gates. I have a framed picture of, uh, of, one of, the, of the one that was on the Jaffa Gate, it was uh, someone made a silk screen of it, sold those, I bought it. And underneath the Hebrew words that he wrote is uh, the image of a mezuzah, which is the, a box that's attached to every doorway in which the copy of that verse is. It is the central statement of faith for Judaism. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Religious Jews recite it every morning and every evening. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Achad. The importance of it is stressed in Deuteronomy a few verses later where Israelites are commanded to bind that passage to their hand and to their forehead and to write it on their doorposts. Now they took that command literally and so they put a mezuzah on their doorways and they they wear phylacteries on their hand and on their forehead, which are little leather boxes that have scripture in them. It's a foundational statement of Judaism, and it's a foundational statement of our faith. It's made in two propositions. First, that God is a unity. He is one. There are not a plurality of gods. There is only one. And secondly, He is Israel's God in a special way. 
He's Israel's God by covenant. God has brought them sovereignly into a relationship with them, with him. And that's indicated in the next chapter in Deuteronomy 7, where in verse 6, Moses said, God has chosen you to be a people of his own possession. That is grace. We sang amazing grace a little while ago. That is an example of amazing grace. Of all of the nations of the world, God chose Israel in His choice of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and made a covenant with them. He made them the most blessed nation on the face of the earth. So whenever the Israelite would recite Deuteronomy 6.4, he would remind himself of the unique relationship that he had with God. He is the only God, and He was their God by God's sovereign choice. Moses made that clear in chapter 7 of Deuteronomy, in verse 8, where he explained that the nation was chosen by God, not because of anything within them. He talks about them, you're not the greatest of the nations, you're not the largest, you're not the most mighty, you're, you're the least of all the nations, but He chose you, and why did He choose you? Because He loved you. Why do He love you? Because He loved you. There's nothing in them. It's all in Him. That is grace. And grace demands a response. And the response is given in verse 30, quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. In other words, we're to love Him with our whole person. Heart, soul, and mind. They are terms that overlap somewhat, but what is clear enough is our whole inner person is to be devoted to God. And we are to love Him with all our strength, with our body and our soul. The soul, which is made up of the the mind and the will, the feelings that we have, all of that directs the body. The love of God as set forth here is not some easy, ill-defined feeling, a a mood or sentiment. It is carefully defined in this, this statements that the Lord reads. It is active. It is the product of the mind and our strength. It is knowing God. It is understanding Him. It is knowing who He is, what He has done, what His attributes are, what His accomplishments are, what He has promised to do and what He will certainly do. It is all of the revelation that He's given us. He cannot be confused with something else. We must know Him according to His revelation and the revelation which has been given to us in the Bible. Things outside of that are not part of that revelation. And so first of all, we must know Him. Know Him as He's revealed to us in the Word of God. So love involves understanding. There's no loving God apart from knowledge. But we must also obey Him. It's with all our strength. Jesus told His disciples, If you love Me, you will keep My commandments. We cannot really love God without obeying Him. All of our mental faculties, our thoughts, our will, our feelings, all of that, all all of our actions, our strength, all are to be devoted to God. And Moses emphasizes that here with this word all. He repeats it four times. All, 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 all. We are to have wholehearted love for God. Love that is undivided in its loyalty to Him. That is His by right. Three or four weeks ago, I quoted the Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper, who was an amazing man, um, was Prime Minister of Holland. He was a, a writer, an educator, started the Free University of Amsterdam. And he was a significant theologian of the early 20th century, and he made a statement that has been described as one of his best-known statements. I say best-known among those who are familiar with him and who are generally Reformed. Uh, 
in their theology. But he, in a speech he gave, stated, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not say, mine. And one who walks with him gives all to him gladly. So, what is man's highest responsibility? What is most important in life and most pleasing to God? It is loving Him. I like what William Lane wrote in his commentary. The great commandment is to seek God for His own sake, to have pleasure in Him. That means knowing Him, having fellowship with Him. God is more pleased with that than you teaching Sunday school or giving large checks to the church or even being a good husband or a good mother. Those are all good. I'm not saying that. Those are all very important. But this is the best. This is the most important. Loving God. But there's a corollary to that, a result from it, and that is that love for God begets love for man. That's what Jesus says next in verse 31. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. So the Lord's answer to the scribe was really more than the scribe asked for. He said, what's the greatest commandment? And the Lord gave him two answers, two commands. But they go together. The first is real devotion to God, but if left by itself, we might not be sure how our devotion and service is demonstrated, and it might degenerate into superstition, ritual, or kind of monasticism, where we just go off by ourselves, isolate ourselves, look into ourselves, and just meditate and reflect upon God and loving Him. So Jesus added, added this second command, which is the consequence of the first. And that's Leviticus 19, verse 18. That's what the law teaches. Love for man and concern for life. Now that principle is illustrated all through the law by the commandments, the various commandments. It's illustrated, for example, from Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 19, where Israel is instructed that in time of war, when they were besieging a city, they were not to cut down fruit trees. If they needed to build a ramp or something, they could cut down any kind of tree they wanted, but not a fruit tree. Now, God's not concerned about fruit trees. It was an example. It's an illustration to teach the nation the value of life by preserving trees that bear fruit, trees that, that sustain life with their fruit. The law promotes life. Or take that strange command, you are not to boil a young goat in the milk of its mother. It's clear enough what it says. It's obvious what is to be done and not to be done. But what does it mean? And this is one of those passages that rabbis debated over that very point. What's the meaning of this? Well, it's not about nourishment or diet. It's intended to teach Israel moral sensitivity, the, the decencies of right feeling. It is cruel and indecent to destroy a baby goat in the very milk that is to sustain its life. It is an immoral thing to use its mother for its death. God and His revelation promote life, not death. Kindness and compassion, not callousness. Now, having said all that, Christians are not under the law. Then we, we are no longer under these commandments. We're not obligated to keep these commandments. Paul told the Corinthians, food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. If we do. Food is irrelevant, so you can eat a cheeseburger. You're not violating the law. 
Those laws were never about imparting righteousness to the Israelite. They were about teaching truth about righteousness. And while we're not obligated to keep the rules of the law any longer, the law of Moses is still the Word of God. The law of Moses is still valuable to us, as valuable to us as it was to Israel. It instructs us still. We learn from it. And it teaches us the value of life. It teaches us to protect it, to protect the weakest of us. The concerns of God today are no different than they were then and before the law was even given. And what all this is to say, in terms of what the Lord was saying here to this scribe, is we're to look out for one another. And here, by bringing these two commandments together, loving God and man, the Lord was saying, those who love God will seek the welfare of his creation and of man, the highest part of his creation. The standard for this is a very personal one. The standard is a high one. We are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And we love ourselves by seeking the best for ourselves. That's not selfish. That's wise. That's the Proverbs. In Ephesians 5, verses 28 and 29, where Paul is instructing husbands how to love their wives, he said that they are to love them as they love their own bodies. He wrote, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. That's normal conduct toward oneself. We nourish our bodies, and we're to treat others in the same way. We are to be as concerned about our neighbor's welfare as we are about our own. We're to look after him. We're to look after her. We don't defraud or seduce, but support and nourish. We sacrifice for others. Now, that, that sounds on the face of it a lot like the answer Rabbi Hillel gave while standing on one foot. What you yourself hate? Do not do to your neighbor. But there's a significant difference. Hillel's answer was essentially negative, and the Lord's was positive. A person could follow Hillel's advice without helping his neighbor. J just never do any overt harm to him. Just stay out of his way. You could go off to some monastery somewhere, go live in a cave somewhere, and never see anyone and basically fulfill Hillel's instructions. But Jesus put things in the active. He put it in the positive. Don't just avoid bothering your neighbor. Help him when he or she needs help. So who is our neighbor? Well, the Lord answered that in the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Our neighbor is, is not just the guy next door, but anyone we meet and anyone in need. been reading... Um, some letters of Martin Luther. They're letters, I think I've mentioned this before, but letters that expand his, his whole ministry uh, from the late 15 teens, 1519 to the day, to the year of his death and the uh, years later. And one of them is a long letter written to one of the cities of Germany giving counsel on what do we do when plague comes to our town because plague had come to Wittenberg and he had to respond to that. And basically what he says is you, have, you lay down your life for your neighbor. You be willing to risk everything for your neighbor. And then he made the statement, and I'm not going to quote it exactly, but to the effect, this is the highest form of worship serving God's people, serving others. What then is the greatest commandment? The Lord's answer is love. Love for God and love for man. The scribe agreed with Jesus and was enthusiastic in his response. Right, teacher, he said. And then he repeated back to him the Lord's command to love and added that love has the greatest value. He said to him, it, it is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. 
Now that was an advance on the thinking of his day, which was given to ritualism. It was given to uh, keeping all of the laws and doing all of the sacrifices. And I should add at this point, it wasn't wrong to sacrifice. It wasn't wrong to give offerings. All of that was prescribed in the law, and they were to follow that. But what had happened was it had become ritual. It had become empty ritual, and the deed itself, without anything else, without the heart in it, was acceptable to them, and it wasn't acceptable to the Lord God. Empty ritual and ceremony is not what pleases God, but a loyal heart. And it's always been so. If this scribe was reading the scriptures carefully, he knew that from reading the scriptures because the scriptures taught the value of moral life and especially love over ritual. You remember in, in 1 Samuel 15 when Saul is waiting for Samuel to come before a great battle and Samuel doesn't show up and Saul becomes anxious and he notices that men are leaving. His army is melting away and how's he going to fight a battle? And so he takes things into his own hands and he acts as a priest, which is not what he was to do. And he made a sacrifice. And just as he does that, Samuel arrives and Samuel says, you have been disobedient. And then he says to him, to obey is better than sacrifice. God doesn't care about those sacrifices if there's not obedience in it. David wrote in Psalm 40, sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. Later in Psalm 51, he wrote, you do not delight in sacrifice. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. The Lord looks on the heart. He wants that. He wants our love and loyalty over all forms of religion and even over our sacrifices, our sacrifices of time and service, whatever sacrifices we make. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, Paul wrote, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. The scribe seems to have understood that and to have advanced in his thinking beyond most of his contemporaries. Jesus recognized that in him. Passage ends, verse 34, when Jesus saw that he answered intelligently, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Now that's a somewhat ambiguous answer, and I think it's deliberately ambiguous and designed to provoke reflection in that scribe. He was a humble man, it seems, clearly drawn to the Lord. Still, he wasn't quite there. While he confessed that sacrifices were not good enough, they're not enough. Those sacrifices did point to a sacrifice that was enough, the one above all others that God did desire and is necessary. It's the sacrifice that would end all sacrifices and offerings of the sacrificial system, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son. That alone brings a person into the kingdom. Jesus was encouraging this scribe to look further, to look to Him in order that He may enter the kingdom. Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to Myself. And of course, if a person truly loves God, he will love or she will love God's Son and believe in Him. And not believe in Him as a great teacher that He was, not believe in Him simply as a wonder worker, which He was, went around doing good, which He did, but love Him as the Savior who came to be lifted up. That ultimately is love for God. Hopefully the scribe went on to recognize that. The Lord set him on the path to doing that. Because in those two great commands is a standard too high for anyone to achieve. Who can say that they love God perfectly or 
that they love their neighbor anywhere as much as they love themselves? No one. If, if this becomes a person's standard for entering the kingdom, then he must despair. Scriptures are clear in both the Old and the New Testaments that there is none righteous, not even one. We understand that when we understand how impossible it is for us to keep the law. How impossible it is to achieve personal righteousness that's acceptable to God. And when a person understands, that, uh, understands his or her inability to achieve or produce that righteousness, he or she then turns to the gospel of the cross, the gospel of grace. Bishop J.C. Ryle wrote, It is only gross ignorance of the requirements of God's law which makes people undervalue the gospel. In other words, it's ignorance for a person to think they can accomplish the law. It is an inflated and unrealistic belief in themselves. He continues, the person who has the clearest view of the moral law will always be the person with the highest sense of the value of Christ's atoning blood and will value that highly because he knows that only Christ and His sacrifice saves. The reason is we can't keep the law. It only condemns us. It's intended to bring us to the point of despair. We need a Savior or we're lost. But once we find Him, or better, once we are found by Him and brought to faith in Him, then we do have new abilities. The problem of society is not a lack of laws, but a lack of life. It is a cold, cruel world, but people think that they can control it, they can manage it with a new law, when what is needed is a new heart, a heart of flesh to replace a heart of stone. That's what the child of God has through the new birth. And through the new birth, we have been made right with God through faith in Christ to become a new creation with new abilities, a new nature, and the Holy Spirit within us. Now these two great commands are a real compass for our journey through this present world. The person who lives to glorify God and to love his neighbor will always do right. Life lived like that, loving God above all things and reaching out with love to those around us is a potent testimony of the saving grace of God to a fallen world. Mr. St. John, who I quoted at the beginning, described the world uh, of a generation ago as a chilly, loveless place. And it was, and it is. But that's nothing new. It's been that way from the moment Adam fell in the garden and brought down the human race with him. But what a great witness and message the church has for that world, that fallen world, when we exhibit love toward one another and toward the world itself. When we do that, people notice. They did in the early years of the church. And many were greatly impressed by the relationships that they saw among Christians. Tertullian, one of the church fathers in the second century, gave their words in an often quoted statement, look how they love one another and how they are ready to die for each other because as Tertullian said, they, the world, hate one another and kill each other. They looked at the world and they saw hate. They looked at the church and they saw love. In fact, love that the church had for the world. Edwin, Edward Gibbon wrote of that in The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire and of the influence it had on the establishment and the growth of the church in those early years. The, Early Christians had regard, he said, for the distressed and deprived among the pagans. They cared about the pagans. And the pagans took notice. They mocked the creed of the church, but 
they had to acknowledge its benevolence. It was a, a colder, harsher world than our own. People had no hedge on the future. They had no social safety net. And people were callously abandoned to their miseries, to the want and sickness of old age. They were just discarded. Well, Christians took them in and they cared for them as they cared for the young. Infanticide was a common practice among the pagans. If parents didn't want an infant that was born, I don't want a daughter, I want a son, they'd cast her off. It was the way they treated an unwanted child. They would leave it outside, leave it on a a barren, windswept hill to die from the elements, exposing their children. Gibbon wrote how Christians would frequently rescue them from death, baptize them, raise them, educate them. They did this frequently, he said, and he believed that that was one of the reasons the church grew. It, they, they took in abandoned babies. It was a loveless world. But the pagans saw love in the church. And they were impressed. Those were not lives given to ritual and sacrifice, but to being sacrifices. What Paul instructs us all to be in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, living and holy sacrifices, well-pleasing to God. History is filled with great stories about Christians sacrificing themselves But there's no reason they should be stories of the past. They should be true today. May God put that within each of us. Put that within our hearts to be sacrifices for others. He will do that supernaturally by increasing our love for Him, which will result in love for others. Get that order. Understand the order of that. Love God and then you will love one another. But that will only happen as we study His Word. As we learn who He is. Learn about His promises. Learn about what He has done. What He will do. Learn about His grace. And in learning about His grace, learn that He has done it all. We're but the recipients of the unconditional Immense love of God. Have you experienced that love? Have you experienced that grace? Something we learn from this passage is a person can be not far from the kingdom without being in it. Close, but lost. Don't get close and fail to enter. Believe in Jesus Christ. Come to Him. He receives all who do. And then He will transform your life. Let's stand and sing one of our hymns in the white book, the Songs of Praise. Hymn number 24. And remain standing for the benediction. Oh my soul. Hymn number 24 in the white book. What a great hope we have, Father, to see Your Son someday face to face. And that moment will mean transformation for us. And all of the difficulties and sorrows of life will be behind us forever. Thank You for the great gift of eternal life and the hope of the kingdom to come and the eternal state and all that we have in Your Son. May we live lives in the present to Your glory and to His honor. We pray these things in His name. Amen. Thanks for